Hello, it's a pleasure to be able to present um, my work to you. Today I'll be talking about perceptual beginnings to language acquisition, critical periods, and multisensory um, influences. So, as we all know, language acquisition is a uniquely human capacity. People are familiar with the major production milestones. By about eight months of age, babies show reduplicated babbling, ba 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 ba. That on average, they produce their first words by 10 to 12 months of age. They're combining words by about 18 months, and they're using complex um, sentences um, and clauses by two to three years and four to five years of age virtually all the structures of spoken language acquisition are in place. Um, comprehension, though, begins much earlier. Babies respond to their own name by four months. So you can imagine how I felt when my uh, youngest granddaughter didn't get a name for at least a month. Um, they respond now, we know, to common words by six months of age, and in some cases, even four months of age. So they'll look longer at the picture of um, a foot versus a hand when they hear hand, for example, and of their mother versus another woman when they hear mommy. And the steps in bilingual acquisition are very similar. So even though a bilingual baby is growing up having to learn two languages simultaneously, the steps and in many cases, the timing of progress are very similar. Now what's important is that for this talk is that perception provides the first point of entry into the native language. Because although of course we're, even if we're born, ready to learn language, we have to be exposed to a language in order to learn it. And it's the perceptual systems that provide the first point of entry into language. And they progressively build on the organization that is already in place in a cascading stepwise fashion. And some of that organization, as you'll hear, is already in place from um, some of that organization to the native language from listening to language in utero because some properties, the rhythmical properties, the melody, et cetera, are heard by the baby in utero. And it's, so it's an intricate dance uh, between nature and nurture. Now, um, in this talk, I'll go through um, describing some of the initial sensitivities babies have to language. I'll focus quickly on phonetic discrimination, that is the individual speech sounds that make up language. I'll talk about the process of perceptual attunement, becoming um, a specialist at perceiving the native language. And then I'll go through some um, processes and mechanisms that contribute to this. I'll talk about potential critical periods in perceptual attunement, what the mechanisms might be by which babies establish their native phonetic or phonemic repertoire, and I'll consider as well the role of multisensory processing. Um, and throughout, I'll be relating this to later language acquisition. And I'll be talking about infants, primarily up to about two years of age. And um, at times the talk will include bilinguals, babies growing up with two languages, as well as babies growing up with monolinguals in a monolingual environment. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, babies are born language ready. They're not language specialists, they're language ready. So one of the ways to illustrate this is through um, the diagram on your right, where we see a DTI rendition of the language pathways in the adult brain, as well as in the newborn brain. And what's critical here is that you can see a lot of the pathways are already in place by birth. And indeed, those pathways are in place uh, by about 26 weeks gestation those initial pathways, and that's before even, or about the same time that the cortex is beginning to get um, and be able to respond to acoustic um, information that the baby will be receiving um, in utero. And then rapidly in the first six to eight weeks of life, these blue dorsal pathways that connect the uh, frontal areas to Broca's area and then thus do the frontal um, articulation connections, those rapidly develop in the first six months, six weeks of life. <laughs> 
Okay, so also behaviorally, infants show a preference for listening to speech over non-speech, but already a preference for the language heard in utero, so this intricate dance of nature and nurture. Um, the newborn brain is differentially responsive to speech, to both familiar and unfamiliar languages, but already with a stronger response to the language heard in utero. As I'll talk about in the rest of this talk, young infants discriminate both native and non-native speech sounds, so they're prepared to learn any language. And their brain is already showing a unique signature to speech sound discrimination at birth and even in premature babies. And again, the signature shares many of the properties, but not all of them, of the phonetic response in um, adults. Okay. So the languages of the world have different phoneme inventories. The stop consonants in English are only six, pa, ta, ka, ba, da, ga, whereas a language like Hindi has a much richer repertoire. And for many, many, many years, I've gone, um, I've looked at lots of different things, but gone back repeatedly to looking at um, examining this one contrast as well as others, but this one in particular that's used in Hindi and not English. And that's a distinction between a dental da and a retroflex da, or dental ta, retroflex ta, whereas in English we have only a single sound, an alveolar da, that is where we put our tongue on the alveolar ridge to produce a D in English. And then in some contexts it goes forward or back, like to the dental D, um, or back to the retroflex, but the, the modal rep, uh, production in English is alveolar. So this distinction is something I'll look at a lot. And what we showed many years ago um, is that young English learning babies are able to discriminate this distinction basically uh, very well, but by about 10 to 12 months of age, they stop doing so unless they're growing up in a Hindi environment. And then their discrimination is even sharper. Um, this has been replicated many times with the same contrast and with other speech sound distinctions of many types using a variety of behavioral tasks, both this condition head turn uh, procedure that you see here as well as habituation, a lot of different tasks, and it's also been replicated using um, EEG, uh, FNIRS, a lot of different um, imaging modalities. And importantly, bilingual infants maintain the distinctions used in both of their uh, languages and may have continued sensitivity to non-native ones for a little bit longer as well. So we think of then speech perception as a process of attunement. At birth, babies are born, as I said, with a preference for listening to language, any language, but even at birth, it's already a little bit stronger to the native language, and that gets stronger, much stronger across the first year of life. For many properties of language, syntax, um, prosody, et cetera, and what I'm focusing on here, speech sounds, phonetic contrasts, babies become specialists again across the first year of life. So, but by 12 months, they're far superior at discriminating native sounds and much worse at non-native ones. Um, and what's interesting is this perceptual attunement to the speech sound inventory in, infan in infancy predicts vocabulary at two years of age. So a baby in the first year of life who's better at discriminating native sounds and worse at non-native ones is going to have a large, it, it has, it's correlated with a larger vocabulary at two years. And by 18 months, these phonological categories are very robustly guiding word learning. So uh, this just shows, um, compares Dutch and Canadian English learning babies on their facility at mapping a short versus long vowel uh, version of tam, 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 to two different objects. Now this is not distinctive in English. We don't make a lexical distinction between short and long vowels, but in Dutch they do. And by 18 months, at 18 months, as you can see, Dutch babies can learn to map these vowel distinctions to two different objects and are surprised 
um, when this object that was labeled with a short vowel is now labeled with a long vowel and look longer at the switch, whereas Canadian babies don't do that, Canadian English babies. Okay. I've described this work as involving potentially a series of cascading critical sensitive periods, critical or sensitive periods. So in very early babies become better at discriminating the native language from an unfamiliar language on the basis of the rhythmical and melodic properties. This may be critical period like. Um, as we're talking about here, they attune to the native phonetic categories um, within the first year of life. Um, so they're probably most open to input around eight to ten months and then become less so. Um, and there, this then guides the learning of word forms and phonological categories um, and predicts later um, language outcomes. And we've discussed this, it's with um, Takao Hinch that I've started looking at a mechanistic explanation for potential critical periods in especially the tuning to native phonetic categories. Okay, so why do we use the term critical period? What is a critical period? So a critical period is a point in development when the, when the uh, system, and these are strongest for sensory systems like audition, is most open to input. And before that period and after that period, input or heard speech is less, lang less likely to have an impact on speech perception. And what Takao's work has shown, Takao Hinch's work has shown, is that this is an active process. There's a dynamism between the brain trying to learn, trying to be open to experience, and um, molecular and active processes that are put in place to prevent this learning. And this is, um, so he's identified some molecular breaks that are in place prior to and after the period of most sensitivity to input. And it turns out that these breaks act in many cases on a particular set of interneurons, parvalbumin cells, and it's the critical balance of inhibition to excitation that opens and closes plasticity. Um, and Takao's work and that of others has outlined the circuit whereby this happens. And so here you can just see these are the parvalbumin cells. This is a GABA modulated circuit. There are lots of inputs to it. And I think what's important there is that while um, typically um, it's a combination of both maturation the brain has to be ready for the input and experience that's necessary um, for uh, critical periods to come into play. While there may be an expected and typical maturational course and expected environmental input um, to work on, to act on those circuits, there are lots of different types of experience and other um, modulators that can change that timing. So, um, and some of those come from different types of natural experience or exposure to drugs. And some of those have been tested, uh, many of them through active manipulations, experimental manipulations um, in Takao and other people's labs using animal model work. And what they've learned from this is that while there is a typical critical period, under certain exposure conditions or manipulations, this can open precocially or be delayed in opening. It can be extended or narrowed. It can stay open, um, for example, in some knockout mice. Um, and it can never open or be dampened. And so it isn't, there's a lot of discussion in the developmental literature as to whether these should be called critical or sensitive periods. And for a sensory system like auditory speech perception, a sensory system that is tightly coupled with a higher cognitive system, 
I'm comfortable calling it a critical period and taking a mechanistic approach because by understanding the keys that open and close that critical period or allow it to reopen, we can understand why some people can learn languages at different points in life or we can understand um, how input works to shape the perceptual language system, how aberrant input or aberrant experiences might change the timing and whether that's good or bad, and we're in better position uh, to intervene. And I just think that's a much more precise way to go forward than saying, oh, it's a sensitive period because some people can learn a language without an accent at a later age. Why, I think is the question, and this allows us to address that. Okay, as I mentioned, sensitive uh, period sensitivity is gated by maturation. So this is some work that I did with Marcella Pina and Gislin uh, Dahan Lamberts, where we showed that even babies who are born up to three months early um, do not start attuning to the native language until they've reached the maturational age. So we have an ERP signature um, of a change in both um, overfrontal and posterior areas, so ba 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 da or dental da 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 da. And what's important here is that in a full term infant, they can discriminate this Hindi difference at nine months and no longer do so uh, by 12 months. Uh, but in the premature baby, this sensitivity remains open for however many weeks premature they were. So its experience is important, but it only acts on a maturationally ready brain. And similarly, different types of exposure can change critical period timing. So this is work that I did um, with Cal Hinch, uh, Tim Oberlander, and Whitney Wycombe was the postdoc who led it. Um, and I, in that circuit diagram that I showed you, um, one of the neuromodulators to those GABA modulated, to those parvalbumin cells is um, selective uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, in other words, antidepressants, a class of antidepressants. So we asked whether maternal exposure to these antidepressants in utero or untreated maternal depression can change the timing of, um, of sensitivity and perceptual attunement. And what we found is that as predicted by uh, that circuit, mothers who were depressed during their pregnancies and chose with their doctors to take SRIs did have accelerated onset of critical period plasticity. Um, and whereas, um, and they showed that by discriminating a consonant distinction in utero. So typically, prior to birth, still in utero, babies can discriminate vowel distinctions, not consonant distinctions, but these mums babies, and we tested this with a fetal cardiograph, were able to discriminate a consonant distinction in utero. And by six months, we're no longer discriminating the non-native distinction. Um, on the other hand, um, untreated maternal depression also has a cascading uh, set of hormonal and endocrinological um, events that also get into those circuits. And what we found is that the babies of mums who had been depressed during their pregnancy maintained sensitivity to the non-native speech contrast longer. Um, and so maternal depression that was not treated seemed to um, delay the closing of the critical period. Now what we're testing now is um, whether that has an impact, either of those, on later development. And we're testing children who are 10 years of age. And what we're finding is that those who had SRI exposure in utero um, are showing um, less precision in their phonological representations at age 10. And um, we'll have some, our final results in the next couple of months. Whether delay 
is going to um, have a similar problem, uh, similar consequences, um, I think is less clear because if the whole system is being delayed in development and input comes later and everything's happening um, in synchrony, that might be okay. But we can talk about that more in the question period on July 30th. Okay. What are the mechanisms by which babies attune to the native language? So this is something that um, my students and I have looked at um, for many years. Um, there are lots of different ways that babies can learn the speech sound inventory of their native language. And here's an illustration from a paper that Henny Young, Katie Yoshida, and I published um, many years ago now in Current Directions. And basically, if you think about the type of input a Hindi versus English learning baby is getting, a baby who's growing up in English hears an alveolar D um, with my Kansas accent, and um, the vowel is ah, so doll, and they'll hear this, they just, they hear a distribution of sounds around this modal way of pronunciating doll. Now my tongue is on the alveolar ridge when I say doll, but if I say this doll, my tongue might be pulled forward or with doll um, by the preceding consonants. And if I say your doll, my tongue is probably pulled back by that D. And so sometimes that my pronunciation is more dental-like and sometimes it's more retroflex-like, but most often, it's like a modal alveolar pronunciation. A baby who's growing up in Hindi, here's two modes. One around the dental, more front, dal, for lentils, the word for lentils. So that's a word that's made its way into the English language. And the retroflex, dal, for branch. Now notice as well, no, we'll just keep it at that. So what um, Jessica May and I looked at when she spent some time in my lab while she was still um, a student is we asked experimentally whether by presenting babies six to eight months of age when they should be at that peak of openness to environmental input, whether presenting them with a bimodal versus unimodal distribution of sounds that go from, uh, we created an acoustic continuum, so they go from a front dental um, da to a back retroflex da. We had two groups of infants. They were both presented with all steps along this continuum. They all heard steps one through eight but they heard them in a different frequency distribution. So for one set of English learning babies, um, they heard more instances of step two and step seven. And the other group of English learning babies heard more instances of steps four and five. Um, so they got a unimodal uh, uh, distribution. And we just presented these sounds to them for like two minutes. Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. And then we tested discrimination of the endpoints. And what we found is that at six to eight months, English learning babies who had been given the bimodal distribution were better at discriminating the endpoints than were English learning babies who had been given the unimodal distribution. Now, by 10 months, this didn't work as well. And similar results have been reported by Lou and Kager and some others, but Lou and Kager's um, for um, a tone distinction. So there seems to be a period of age, distributional learning does seem to be a mechanism tracking this frequency, these statistics in the input, by which babies might be able to change their speech sound categories. And it seems to be from the limited behavioral work that had been done at that time, most uh, effective at around um, before the ending of the period of attunement. 
And more recently, um, in my lab, Rebecca Ray, who did a postdoc with Takao Hinch um, and is now, uh, I mean, did her PhD with Takao and is now doing a postdoc in my lab, Rebecca um, uh, Takao Hinch and I um, asked the same question about distributional learning, but using a more sensitive ERP technique and also using a, um, uh, a much denser set of sounds. So rather than just eight steps along a continuum, she created a 200 step continuum. And importantly, Rebecca looked at a native distinction, raw law. And the critical question here, so some babies got a unimodal uh, distribution, other babies got a bimodal distribution. Um, and the critical question here is, all babies should be able to continue to discriminate raw law at 10 to 12 months of age, right? And so, because they're English learning, and this is an English distinction. So we were able to assess the efficacy of distributional learning as a learning mechanism, separate from um, whether they could discriminate it. If When we test them on a non-native distinction and distributional learning doesn't work at 10 to 12 months of age, we don't really know whether it's because distributional le learning no longer works or they can't hear the sound differences to keep track of the distributional statistics. So here, Rebecca tested them using a native distinction raw law. And she tested babies at um, five, nine and 12 months of age. I'm just presenting the five and 12 month data. Um, and basically what she found, again, using an ERP, is that um, in a, um, following a unimodal distribution, the babies were not able to distinguish the distinction. Um, there was no difference between the deviant and the standard, so it was an oddball paradigm like dental, 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 retroflex. But um, in the um, bimodal distribution, they were at five months of age, sorry, rah, 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 la. Um, so they were not the unimodal collapsed discrimination at five months, but the bimodal maintained it. Um, at nine months, we had a, um, an effect only in one direction for raw law. And at 12 months, babies were able to discriminate raw law irrespective of whether they were given a unimodal or bimodal uh, distribution in the learning phase. So I think what these results show um, more robustly than the behavioral data is that distributional learning is effective at changing baby speech sound categories before and during the period of perceptual attunement. But once they've established their native categories and they're well in place, at least um, the the timing of exposure, the duration of exposure that we gave them in this task was insufficient to change their categories by 12 months of age. So this is support for at least a sensitive period for the efficacy of distributional learning as a mechanism for attunement. Now let's just go back to this picture. The other characteristic um, that distinguishes uh, experience in babies growing up with one language versus another is that in English, for example, back to the Hindi dental retroflex distinction, babies hear variations in the word doll all around one category of objects, whereas in Hindi they hear the variations around two categories of objects. Now what Hindi Jung asked when he was in my lab is might the learning of words or the pairing of different sounds with different objects be a mechanism by which babies collapse or keep separate um, these speech sound distinctions? And Henny and I published this first 
paper in 2009 and then some follow-ups um, in 2014. But in 2009, um, we did not yet know as a field that babies were actually starting to understand some words um, by six months of age. There had been some one early study um, from Peter Jusik's lab, but as a field, we hadn't accepted that. So this was a really radical idea on Henny's part. And the way that um, we implemented this is we simply gave babies experience with a consistent pairing, a dental doll with one object, a retroflex doll with another object, or an inconsistent pairing where they heard the dental and retroflex DAWs with each objects with each object. And we ask following just a couple of minutes experience with these distinct sound object pairings, if that would facilitate discrimination in babies nine to 10 months of age who were already um, beginning to attune to the native language. And what Henny's work showed is that indeed it did. So those babies who experienced a consistent path pairing of dental with one object, retroflex with the other, were able to discriminate once the objects were removed and it was just a simple listening, um, looking at a checkerboard discrimination task, they were able to discriminate the retroflex dental still at nine to 10 months of age, whereas the babies who had had the inconsistent pairing were not. And in subsequent work, Henny showed that with um, uh, a tone contrast, um, babies need referential cues, so they need to know that this is about word learning for this acquired distinctiveness manipulation to work. And in work with Thierry Nazi, he showed that this kind of exposure can generalize um, to uh, another uh, similar distinction. So um, this acquired distinctiveness, particularly referential pairing of different sounds with different words, may be a really important mechanism of perceptual attunement. And what's interesting about it is that it's one that's tied to language. So if we think about distributional learning, babies hear statistics, track them, set up one or two, or maintain one or two categories, and then have to map that onto words. Whereas in the case of this acquired referential distinctiveness, the learning of speech sounds and the learning of words occur together. So there's no second mapping required. So this may turn out to be a more efficient learning mechanism. We're testing that now in my lab. And similarly, whereas there seems to be a critical or sensitive period for distributional learning, what we don't yet know is whether there is or not for acquired distinctiveness. It's hard to make this procedure effective for adults with non-native uh, distinctions, but I keep trying to see if there's something in there whereby maybe a higher order center in the brain, um, even if those um, basic sensory circuits are closed, might allow some um, use of this learning strategy. So that's ongoing work. Okay, I want to end by talking a little bit about multisensory processing. So this is me nine and a half years ago with my first grandchild. Um, babies experience speech in a multisensory uh, context. They don't just listen to us, they watch us when we're talking to them um, and they imitate us um, more or less well from the beginning. Um, we've shown that babies make sense of the visual information in speech. So uh, babies at, um, babies when they're habituated to three um, English speakers, English, French English bilingual speakers, speaking in one language or the other with the sound turned off, so they just get to watch their silent talking faces, um, they can discriminate the change. Um, I won't show you, um, well, I'll just show you quickly. Um, so, um, which side do you think she's speaking French on? And which side do you think she's speaking English on? Um, it's on your right that 
she's speaking um, French and you can see that with the rounded vowels. Okay, so that's the task we gave babies and monolingual English babies at four and six months can discriminate the change. They're no longer doing so by eight months. And whereas bilingual babies, French English babies in this case, seem to maintain that sensitivity. So there's perceptual attunement to visual language discrimination as well. Now more, um, oh yeah, this visual only discrimination is also changed by depression and SRIs exposure, antidepressant um, exposure. So this is more of the work that we also studied um, visual language discrimination in this group of babies um, whose mums had been depressed. And there was an acceleration of the timing of attunement in babies um, whose moms had taken SRIs in utero, and there was a delay in the timing of attunement in those babies whose moms had experienced depression and um, had not taken SRIs. I just want to stop here for a second and say this is not to say it's wrong to take SRIs or it's wrong to not take medication. Depression is like, puts the fetus and the mom and the whole family system at high risk and people need to make the choices that they need to make to treat it. This is just to understand what some of the impact of different choices might be. So again, that we're at, in a better position to support moms for whatever decision they make. Okay, now speech um, is not just auditory, not just visual, it's multisensory. I'm not going to show the McGurk effect, but basically your speech perception is influenced by what you see as well. And babies from a very early age, two months at least, show bimodal matching of heard and seen speech. So when they hear ah, they'll look to this face. When they hear e, they'll look to the face making the e sounds. This attunes as well by the end of the first year of life. Um, and um, is something that also might be sensitive or critical period in nature. And speech, and language processing stays auditory visual. By 18 months, babies can transfer from auditory to visual in word learning. So basically, if they learn a word um, auditorily and then they only um, see somebody producing it after they've had an opportunity to learn it, um, they can look to the right match. So that's kind of cool. So if they learn it, just listening, they first see and hear. No, they don't see the object. They, they hear it and see her speaking. Then we just train them on the association in an auditory only task. They can transfer it to visual. They can't transfer from visual to auditory yet, but they can transfer from auditory to visual. So they're establishing when they learn a word, they're also thinking about or establishing what the visual um, representation is. Now, finally, um, as I mentioned, babies don't just watch, they're also moving their own little tongues and articulators from the very beginning, and perhaps not just in watching, but even in listening. And so is speech perception a two-legged stool, auditory and visual, or is it a three-legged stool that also includes feedback from their own oral motor movements? Now the common view of multisensory integration is that from whenever they start producing speech, most people focus on babbling that, as I mentioned, um, is first shown at around eight months of age. But in fact, babies are making oral motor movements in utero um, very early on. But the common view of multisensory integration is that the sensory motor or oral motor um, representation of speech, the auditory representation of speech, and the visual representation of speech each develop independently and then come together at some point um, after birth. 
at about maybe one or two years of age. Some people think it's when they start babbling, other people think it's when they start producing words. An alternative count, which we ascribe uh, to, is that these systems build on one another um, in a kind of Schneerle or um, Herkowitz Gottlieb type fashion. So where the first developing system lays down a template, the oral motor movements the baby is making in utero, uh, allow them to establish something about um, their phonetic space. As sound gets in, this is able to map onto those sensory maps that have been established. And then at birth, when they see people talking, that gets mapped on more completely. And we know that there are articulatory influences on speech perception in, in adults. So um, trans um, magnetic stimulation um, of the lip and tongue areas in the motor cortex disrupts relevant speech perception. And silently articulating speech changes perception. So just moving your lips in one way or, or having them moved in one way or another changes the way that adults perceive speech. And there are many, many, many more examples. So again, Henny Young, when he was a grad student in my lab, asked if there were oral motor influences on auditory visual speech perception. And he looked at matching of E versus U. And basically what he did is he had um, moms hold either a teething toy or a, uh, their finger or another teething toy that allowed them to uh, purse their lips in their baby's mouths. So with the, the finger or teether toy held like this, the baby's lips were more in an E configuration. And with it held like this, they were more in an U configuration. And what he found is that this teething toy disrupted their ability to detect the match. A nut, uh, Following Henny's work, another student in the lab, Alison Bruder, asked where there, whether there were motor influences on auditory-only speech perception, so just motor with no visual speech. And she asked with a non-native contrast, so the babies had not previously heard it or seen it, and with one that uh, a consonant contrast so they were unlikely to be babbling by this age so again she went back to the hindi dental reflex distinction she had moms hold either a flat teether in the baby's mouth that interfered with the tongue tip movement or a gummy teether that did not and um, this just shows that the flat teether did indeed the red line prevent their tongue tip from moving whereas the gummy teether the green line did not and what she found is that the flat teether disrupted discrimination. So using a different procedure, babies could discriminate the DAW, the dental retroflex DAW at six months without anything in their mouth or with the gummy teether, but not when the flat teether was in their mouth that interfered with tongue tip movement. And more recently, um, Sherry Choi um, had a paper published where she replicated this effect for DADA um, using more carefully controlled stimuli, as well as showed that the same gummy teether that did not disrupt discrimination of the dental retroflex, but did prevent lip movements, um, interfered with discrimination of BADA. So it really is articulator specific. Now, finally, you know, you can see these effects. They're there. They're not huge. So um, Sherry Choi has also done an ERP study of this. And uh, basically, uh, here she just used um, uh, the um, teether, the teething toy that prevents um, tongue tip movements. And she tested, first of all, um, auditory discrimination with nothing in the baby's mouth. And this time she tested three to four month olds who definitely cannot babble. And um, without anything in their mouth, they could discriminate both the ba da and the Hindi dental retroflex da da. But with the teething toy put in their mouth and held gently by their mom to prevent tongue tip movement, 
um, Bada discrimination was still maintained, but the dental retroflex was completely disrupted. So this replicates the initial Bruderer et al. effect, but with younger infants and with much more re robust results than um, we had found behaviorally. And this is consistent with the hypothesis that by birth, the sensory percept, the speech perception percepts are multisensory and not just auditory and visual, but that oral motor or sensory motor influences or sensory motor information is part of the percept as well. This is important theoretically for understanding how speech perception develops. It's important um, as well for intervention. Um, and later language acquisition. So if we think about all developing children, yes, the, for the typically developing child, speech and language are multisensory from the get-go. And we need to think about all of those developing systems, how if there are critical periods for each of them, how disruption in input in any one of those systems may affect the full manifold of development and have consequences for later, later language acquisition. And of course, we, it's, it's transparent that a baby who doesn't have um, access to heard speech early on um, may have a disruption in the timing of these changes. There is probably some time for catch up. And as we saw, the system waits to a particular point in development before it's sensitive to input. But if the goal is to have a hearing and speaking child, it's very important to do intervention early on. I'm sure there are, I, I know there are, there's a similar trajectory for sign perception. Um, so it's important to get linguistic input early on. But for children who are learning an oral language, if they have a visual uh, impairment or even an oral motor impairment, that could also have consequences on the uh, development of speech perception and thus potentially, ultimately, on later language use. So it's important to consider these issues um, with um, all developing children. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to answering questions on July 30th. I want to thank as well all my collaborators, my funding sources, my lab. This is a Zoom picture from this week, um, as well as you for inviting me. Thank you.